The Book of Recollections, Episode 11, Friend or Foe, by Dysylvania. This smells like trouble. The way the last recollection ended? Well, at least it would, if I had a nose and I wasn't a book. Shaq just returning like that to the story? I hope you don't mind. But we need to go back in time to the moment right after Gregory's death. I wouldn't be an honest book of recollections if I didn't do it. Let's get to it. I need to know! Shaklashak stood in the shadow of Jormungandr. Bathed in moonlight, the giant serpent seemed even larger and more terrifying. Jormungandr chastised his minion for not having the strength to end Gregory's life, calling him unworthy of the gifts bestowed upon him. Shaq got angry and snapped back, yelling at his master that the human would have been a great asset to their plans. Their argument went back and forth, revealing Shaq's greatest sin. In order to receive his powers from the great serpent, he committed family-side. Sensing that the time his servants spent with Gregory had softened his resolve and clouded his judgment, Jormungandr took back the gift of strength from Shaq, who reverted to his true form a paper-thin beast-man whose broken leg caused him to fall to the ground. The serpent's eye fell on his former servant and revealed with venom in his words that Shaq wasn't the only egg in the nest. As a final show of disgrace towards the once mighty Shaklashak, Jormungandr left him crawling on the ground, chastised him for being unworthy of immortality, and disappeared before the snake folk could ever express his anger. Wrath bubbled up in Shaq's chest as he screamed and trashed on the ground before coiling in a fetal position right there where he stood. He shook and wailed for a long time. Still, he wasn't ready to just give up on his life. He forced himself to a nearby branch sturdy enough to support his weight. The short journey was excruciating, but with effort of will and patience, he managed to seize the small victory. Another triumph followed as he succeeded in standing up and could reliably, yet slowly, walk. He gazed upon the tree which set this whole affair in motion and, using the rituals from the Red Lands, Shaq scribbled Gregory's name upon the defaced bark. He began to make his way towards Greenspring and realized that, in his weakened state, his journey would take too much time. As if to reinforce his concerns, Shaq's leg gave up and he fell to the ground in full view of a storyteller who, seeing him, approached. The two began conversing, revealing some new facts. For example, Shaq was viewed by the tribe with apathy due to his pale complexion. They were all calling Shaq diseased. If one's character was shaped by his peers, then Shaklashak's childhood was a great indication of why he acted the way he did. Time passed, and after a while, Shaq looked into the storyteller's basket, where he saw a jar containing a strange substance, which made him think of Shifty. Uh, I don't think I need to tell you that he managed to steal the item now, do I? But these storytellers seem to appear in the most peculiar moments, and if I may pepper in a bit of, let's call it a theory, we'll see that this jar will be of great importance. I would wage my unwritten pages to this, or as you would call it, I would put my life on the line. Shaq's body turned colder and colder as life began to pour out of it. He took a final gamble and called upon Jormungandr, not only pleading for his powers, but also bounding himself to the great serpent. As consciousness failed Shaklashak, he heard the coil of the great serpent and the monolithic visage of the lupine-headed Jormungandr appeared in front of him, tearing at his own flesh and feeding it to the snake folk. His wounds healed, his body felt more powerful than ever, and, before waking up, the serpent left our protagonist with a final warning. The next act of defiance would be the last thing Shaq would ever do. Healed and back to his full potential, before continuing his journey, 
Shaq took out from his pouch some documents containing trading routes and military movements of the Red Lands, and forged them to look as good as new. Life is an interesting thing. Some are ready to chain themselves to atrocities just to live a few more days, or decades. And in doing so, they only prolong the decay of their souls and the hurt they bring into the world. I had hoped this would be a moment of redemption for Shaq, but my hopes were dispersed, like pages thrown into the wind. <laughs> Let him be on his way to Greenspring as we return to the story and witness the trouble that is brewing. As the group approached Shaq, Castiel and Leo were apprehensive towards the snake folk. Castiel due to his aversion to beast folk, and Leo because he felt that something was off. In seeing these new individuals, using the same talent he did when inspecting the remains of Albus, Shaq discovered that Castiel's right hand was skeletal and coated in necrosis up to his elbow, and that Leo had two fatal wounds on him. The one on his neck was extremely old and enclosed by silver whilst the other, on his chest, was new. The fact that the two caught his intense stares caused them to loathe the beast man even more. Upon being asked what had happened to Gregory, which spurred Leo to gaze into the snake folk's mind, Shaklashak made up a story about how the two of them left in order to prove their quality to Pax, and how they were assaulted by Luminites badly damaged Shaq and were the ones who killed the human. Leo's gaze into Shaq's mind revealed a shadow which devoured the human. For the time being, it seemed that his story held some truth. This story caused Pax to put the snake folk under Leo's escort until he could prove himself, and before leaving to prepare for the trials ahead, Shaq showed them the strange jar which Jen, in her curiosity, opened. The strange amorphous substance expanded so quickly and to such an extent that it exploded, coating everyone in its viscera except for Shaq. Upon touching their skin, the goo was absorbed and it rejuvenated the group, extending their prowess. What was this? A bubble of prowess? An adjuvant of the spirit? Uh, just playing. None were hurt. Besides Castiel's ego, who began to act up, you should have been there, it was wonderful. With their newly found powers, the group split, deciding to meet at the royal stables the following morning. Castiel and Jen went to buy some meat before leaving humanness at the stables, where Castiel ritualistically drew some blood from the horse. An act that drew the ire of Saturni. Even though Castiel had asked for forgiveness from the Astral, returning to his home, Jen was tasked to cook the meat and added two ingredients, her blood and a secret component which only the human knew. Before heading to the basement, Castiel went to his old man and told him that he might not return from the trial, which sparked the two to curse at each other as a way of showing their affection. In the basement, Castiel chopped off one of his skeletal fingers and ground it into paste while adding the blood of his pegasus. After handing it to Jen, he warned her that he should not taste it because she would die, and urged her to leave. Timmy, who helped Jen, was ordered to head upstairs and remain there, which also resulted in more curses towards Castiel. Alone, he ingested the food and… And look. I like creepy things as much as the next book, but this is just too wonderfully grotesque and weirdly uh, sublime to describe here. Words cannot express what happened, you must experience it for yourself, but you need to be alone. And don't get my pages all sticky, let's just get on with the story. Ugh. Leo and Shaq spent the night at the Dark Elf's place, where, in order to find out whether Adam uncovered anything regarding the Queen, they messaged young Hebdom, and, to their shock, it seemed that he had been taken into custody outside the city after finding out that the leader of the Hebdomads gave Prince Philip 14 scrolls, 
which would allow him to open doorways into the fabric of reality. Sadly, the group could do nothing to aid Adam at that point. As light began to engulf Greenspring, Pax found himself in the company of Grace, who urged him to be careful, casting all sorts of blessings upon the half-elf. Their talk and preparations ended with a series of passionate kisses. The group met and put their plans into motion. Castiel was already camping in the woods outside Greenspring in order to follow Pax. Genevieve entered the tapestry she tore up from her family's tomb, and Grace, Pax, Leo, and Shaq went to the starting point of the trial, a place in the forest which sat on the bank of the Sabbath River. There, they met the competitors and their retinues as they were getting ready for the trial. As the race began, Prince Emmerich, the middle child, riding a giant raven named the Legend, took off with such speed that all that was left in its wake was the booming sound of air being ripped apart. Prince Philip, the youngest, using the aid of his allies, opened a doorway through which Shaq and Leo followed. Pax darted forward before meeting with Castiel, who rode a skeletal horse, and the two tied the horses together. Lena and her retinue simply laughed at their competitors and disappeared whilst carrying four bags and some black robes. Prince Finian, the eldest, rode a horse with a star on its forehead and was aided by none other than Nightgale. After a few tense moments in which Shaq and Leo tried to capture Prince Philip, the snake folk pondered why he didn't simply kill the two. Leo accepted to aid the young prince as the two began to make their way towards their objective. Shaq was caught in his contemplations a bit too long and was unable to enter the newly opened doorway, so he began to aimlessly run through the forest. Some time during his run, he caught a glimpse of boats sailing in slow motion across the river and one of the bodies wrapped in bandages had red hair. <gasps> Isn't Lena the only competitor with red hair? What scheme is this? Or is she really dead? After a good while of riding, Pax and Castiel were rushing through a forest whose magical nature turned Pax into a frog. Remembering a story, Castiel kissed the half-elf, but because he did not love him, nothing happened. It only turned an already difficult moment into an awkward one. Unbeknownst to them, it seemed that their speed was somewhat greater than that of the legend who chose to go around the forest as the two competitors were now neck and neck. The sprint lasted for a long while until the three reached the Grand Canyon and, beyond it, they saw the origin point of the Sabbath River. In front of them lay the unthinkable. A gossamer sky which seemed to engulf the expanse, undulating like waves. It was the astral sea. They had reached the end of the world. This was the recap for episode 11 of Vim, as told by the Book of Recollections. I'm Ruxandra Vorotnek, your recap narrator. If you'd like to follow our Dungeons & Dragons campaign, Vim, the Tale of Immortality, Tune in Sundays at 5 UTC on youtube.com slash New recaps drop every Friday evening. Thanks for sticking with us and remember, every subscribe keeps the magic going. Good day, good night, and don't let the vampire bite!